<laughs> that was a fucking disaster. <laughs> oh, I can fix it in post. I no, you can't. Uh, you, you we have a saying in audio, you can't polish a turd. Hello and welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave for our 26th episode of a linear uh, reread through The Song of Ice and Fire. I'll be your host for the evening, Adam, also known as Drowned Snow on the podcast of Ice and Fire Forums, and I am joined by Tanya. Hi, I'm Tanya, Silence on the Forums. Scott. Hey, this is Shaggy Dog on the Forums. Matt. Farley on the Forums. And Hannah. Hey, it's Shadow Baby on the forums. And uh, there might be a couple surprise guests. We'll see. And for all you White Raven fans out there, uh, he was going to join us, but there was a uh, White Raven. <laughs> there was a scheduling conflict, so he he's still alive. Just uh... scheduling conflict. <laughs> yeah, ske- yeah. See, there you go. Uh, so today we're going to be covering the 15th of August, 299, through the 19th of August, 299. It's kind of a, a real tight time frame of the books, but a lot happens here, and we get some really good chapters. So uh, let's just... Yeah, let's just head right into it with Cat 6, and that is... Um, Cat hears about the Battle of the Red Fork... So, uh, yeah, I believe, Matt, you have that chapter for us? Yeah, I could sub in here. So, Cat 6, news of the Battle of the Red Fork. Edmure marched, marches out to the Battle of the Red Fork, trying to make his dying father proud. He's left River Run unmanned and full of refugees. Cat tried to give Brienne some new dresses, but she wasn't having any of it. Cat ponders how she's always done her duty and utters a prayer not just for her family to be victorious, but for comfort for the families of the slain. Kat has always done her duty, but is confused as to what her duty is now. Also, that's a lot of duty. Uh, She also misses someone to advise her and considers praying to the old gods. Kat ponders the futility of war, and Brienne says she'd rather be on the battlefield and have a song sung of her if she died. Master Vyman brings a letter from Lord Meadows, um a distant Castellan of Storm's End, who writes of Sir Courtney Penrose's death. The whole garrison has gone over to Stannis. Meadows doesn't mention Edric Storm, but Cat realizes that Stannis wants him to parade in front of King's Landing. She also ponders how fiercely protective Ned and Penrose were of bastards. She thinks Roos is an exception. He's off conquering Heron Hell for Rob to atone for Ramsay. We also learn that Rob is marching in the direction of House Westerland. Cat sees the first Tully victory, but both she and Brienne agree that Tywin has more troops and will keep feeling for a weakness of the river's defenses. That said, Edmure has the best of the topography. Later that night, she interrogates Cleos Frey, whom she has deliberately given alcohol to loosen his tongue, and learns that Sansa is definitely still alive and that Tyrion will ransom both girls for Jamie. She knows Rob would not agree to this as Jamie is worth much more than two girls. Three days later, the Battle of Red Fork is decisively won, and Tywin marches southeast to Blackwater. Two days later, the news comes to River Run, and Cat feels nervous. All right, so there we go. Um, it's a pretty simple chapter, but uh, there's a lot going on because you know we never get the Rob POV, so we get a lot of this stuff just kind of secondhand or after the fact through Cat. Um, Bina notes here that you know there's a lot of foreshadowing. We get Rob going to the Westerlings. Um, I also am kind of curious. Uh, there's a lot of things in this chapter that I don't know. Sometimes you know when you reread, you pick things up, and then you know on a second reread or third reread, you know that maybe you didn't. And I'm just kind of curious, like what? Uh, how much does Roos know about what's going on here? Like I guess it doesn't really matter, but he thinks Ramsay's dead, right? I, I would think so. Like, how would he? It would be. It would even if if even if somehow someone knew, like in his house, getting him word that Ramsay was still alive wouldn't really be safe. Um, like, do you guys think he's he's really upset by that? Like, or do you think he actually really cares? Or like in his letter, he's just like, ah, it was you know. 
my bastard deserved to die kind of thing. Isn't that like the like eternal debate as to like when Roos and like how much cooperation between Roos and Ramsey and when Roos went? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's always real hard to nail down. Yeah, because like you could look back and be like, ah, oh, this seems like the time when he's in Heron Hall and like burns, you know, something that some people think is a letter from Tywin with an offer, or you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's hard to say, and you know, we don't get enough from him, I think, to get a good feel for it. But I mean, I kind of feel like it's his son either way, so I feel like he wouldn't be too happy about it. He might also realize that. You know, if he's if Ramsey's dead, he deserved it, or he you know he did something to draw attention that he shouldn't have. Or, I mean, I think we debated that last time about how much, you know, was Ramsey acting alone, or you know, was it just kind of opportunistic? And he, but he knew Roos would approve. Like, it's hard to say. Well, either way, it's kind of a win-win situation for Roos. You know, if his kid's alive, hey, great, my kid's alive, and he was you know clever enough to get himself out of some trouble that he got himself in with the Hornwoods, but. Even still, it's a chance for Roos to still make a few moves independently and just sort of cover it up with, you know, oh, I'm doing this in Rob's name to make up for that, you know, embarrassing little situation with my bastard. So it's a win-win situation yeah. for Roos no matter how he looks at it. So I th even if there is no cooperation, he's basically, uh, you know, making lemonade out of the lemons, so to speak. And, and I guess you kind of feel like maybe he's the guy that, regardless, he's going to play it both ways until he has to make a choice. I mean, sort of like a more uh, more cunning Walter Frey. You know, he's he's going to go along both lines, and he's going to do things that could allow him to kind of, you know, fully support Rob in the end, or kind of switch back if he needs to. You know, so maybe he hasn't. You know, maybe he hasn't made up a mind yet. Maybe he just is still playing all the options as as best as he can. Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, like, either way, he sees this war as, like, somehow House Bolton is going to be better than it was, you know, before the war. And I think he kind of yeah. hedges himself that, you know, if Rob wins, you know, Bolton's is, like, right-hand man. If they lose, like, obviously he'll betray him. And well, and, yeah, and even if he doesn't betray him, like, the lower lords don't tend to get the brunt of that. They they kneel, they get forgiven. And at the very least, he goes back home with a bride that brought him a lot of silver, right? So, right. Yeah. Um, I do take note here that uh, despite what Kat does later, she realizes that releasing Jamie is just—it's just not—it's not an option. So. But I mean. I mean, even in her in her own mind, like she knows that Rob won't agree to it, but I think she's she realizes like that's just not a—it's just not smart. Yeah, I, I wonder how much how much she really thinks it's not as like. I wonder if she just thinks it wouldn't work because Rob wouldn't agree to it. I don't know if she. You think she's like convincing herself a little bit because she knows it's not possible? Yeah, maybe. maybe. I mean, I don't know. Well, so. maybe. I think she reflects upon it enough that it's like a bad idea, and it really takes like the trauma of learning that Bran and Rickon were killed to like. Yeah. To push her, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I and I definitely think too here with um um Oh I lost my train of thought. You guys go ahead. Um, but yeah, I mean well, Bran is her favorite child anyway, so I guess she doesn't care that much as long as he's still alive. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. <laughs> she does true. keep going on about that, so <laughs> but I think oh, because she also notes that no one has seen Arya. Right. So like, like, and she, I think uh, towards the end of the chapter when she talks about this, you know, well Tyrion Lannister. Oh well, wait a second. He kind of seemed like he was better than them. You know, the rest of the family. Maybe he'll hold up his like. Oh, maybe he'll hold it up, right? Oh, but wait a second. No one's seen Arya, and he's a liar, and it was his knife that had caused the scar. And my, you know, yada yada yada. And she's like, no, no, not gonna do it. So she sort of talks herself out of it. Well, that's one of the problems that Cat always has is, you know, she can realize when someone's making a move, but she fails to recognize the reasoning and the rationale behind the moves. So her thinking that, you know, Rob is just not going to treat Jamie Lannister for her children um, is probably right. But Rob is probably thinking, you know, God, I'll not only get my sisters back, but I'll get some kind of end to the war as well. Does she know that no one's seen Arya or she just knows no one's talking to her about them? 
Well, the person who brings it's um, is it Cleos Frey? Yep. I'm, I'm trying oh. to remember. Yeah. So like he mentions that. Oh yeah, I, I Sansa was there. I saw Sansa, but oh, I, right. no, okay. I didn't see Arya. Kind of like no one's, the, no one has really said they'd seen Arya. Yeah. So, and I don't. I think this is not the first time that that's been mentioned, to her anyway. Yeah, but considering how much Arya acts up, she's probably in one of the black cells anyway. So you know, it's all good. Well, yeah. She, well, she yeah, she mentions like, oh, well, maybe Arya like wouldn't wouldn't behave and so they just won't let her out but uh, yeah at the same time didn't the original letter did the original letter mention Arya at all sansa's letter or the uh because sansa's first letter back yeah, to winterfeld it, it didn't make any mention whatsoever of Arya. right and she took note of that right and that like hey why didn't she say anything about Arya? uh rob took note of that and he was pissed yeah so and doesn't, anyway doesn't even ev- evidence mounting right yeah, doesn't Sansa even think maybe this is even the first book? But she's like, she didn't even ask about Arya. Like, I think like yeah. r- right after all the Starks get mm. slaughtered, like she's like, ah, oh, I didn't even remember to ask about her. Yeah, so it's a common thread, but the Lannisters clearly still are playing up like they have her, although you know, no one seems to know where, and they're not really in a hurry to prove that they actually have her. But I think Tyrion realized the importance of. Uh, presenting that yes we have Arya even though he, I think doesn't Tyrion assume she's dead yeah I think so which, which is a reasonable thing to assume in the circumstances but... mm. yeah I mean the, the escape, escape is much uh, much less likely you would think for someone her age and yeah. you know he doesn't he doesn't know how capable she is sure. so but yeah so the battle of the Red Fork and you know Edmir doing <laughs> doing a good job as usual but he's not following orders <sighs> oh but 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 he's winning and he keeps winning so uh everything's gonna go according to plan right sure. of course why wouldn't it oh hannah i thought you <laughs> fell back asleep <laughs> <laughs> oh that taka edna aroused her um, yes <laughs> so uh do you guys uh, have anything else to say about this chapter aside from that like Edmir taking action on his own I can kind of understand it because Rob really never lets him in on the overall grand scheme of things sort of plan so he's just going out and saying look you know I'm supposed to be lording over this land and protecting you know the people of land and if other people are marching in on it tearing it apart I need to put a stop to that so if Rob doesn't give him you know, bring him into that inner circle to make sure that he's not stepping out of line, then he's going to take what he thinks is the smart moves. Yeah, I think given the information yeah. that he had, I don't think he acted that unreasonably. I think he gets a lot more shit for that than he deserves. No, I don't I think it's necessarily his fault, yeah. but where, where's the black... The blackfish is at River Run at this point, right? No, he's out with uh, Rob in the field. He's with Rob. Like... No, see, yeah, so that's, that's maybe a mistake there, is you're leaving this you know, essentially a kid behind who isn't isn't that experienced, wants to prove himself, you know. Yeah, but Rob, thinks Rob's he needs a kid. To take action. Right, but I mean, Rob has advice. You would think he would have left someone that he knows a little better, you know, that's got a little more experience behind to at least, you know, advise the situation at River Run. Yeah, but Edmir is the heir. Edmure's the heir, so, yeah. So like, you, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't leave someone, you wouldn't leave someone behind to say, like, Edmir, this guy's in charge. But you might leave someone behind to be like, hey, you know, this guy will help you out, yeah. sort of thing. Someone, you know, to... But maybe he just trusted Edmure had people like that at River Run. I don't know. Well, he did leave Cat there, so, you know. Yeah. But even if he it's, had... It's a shame. Oh, you go uh, but even if he had people there to advise him, they still they still would have needed the, the, the complete picture and, and more information to make a more informed decision. So I don't know how much that would have helped. I don't think it was a poor decision. I think he just didn't have as much information as he needed. Hmm. Yeah, and it just shows like nowadays we have you know we have satellites and drones and we you know we can know a lot more. So like something like this would you know you wouldn't run into this problem. Yeah. But back then they're working with such limited information. I mean wars were lost because people went left instead of right. You know on just a, you know a flip of a coin basically. Yeah. So. Yeah. What do you do without Google Maps? <laughs> Edmure checks in at River Run. All right. 
<laughs> uh, you guys want to move on to Aria 9? Yeah. Let's see. And uh, Michael is... Or no, that's you. Hannah. Yes, my deep shame. I neglected my duties here. Yes. Well, you don't have to like let anyone know. You could just fake it. Yes, but then uh, that's plagiarism, and that's, you know, <laughs> not right. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, as my own staff right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. We, we never read other people's materials. I'm a shadow baby. I just go kill people in the middle of the night. I don't steal. Hello, guys. Sure. Because you you'll, you'll die before you get back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's cool. Shadow principles. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. So thanks, so Tower of night. the Hand. For this little bit of business, is there one written up in the in the in the document? There's, it's yeah, there's it's really weak though. No offense to me, it's just like. <laughs> oh. Well, which one we'll should I just out. do the short and sweet one? Because she's just like, here's the you highlights. You do whatever you, you do whatever you like. Yeah. The Tower of the Hand one seems more legit. Oh. I always paraphrase Tower of the Hand anyway. Like if I'm using them, so. Oh, okay. Well, then the. So, um, so avoid this, plagiarism. This is gonna be my Varley impression. Exactly. Uh, hey guys, uh, just having a drink and. Okay. Are you just talking hot pie in the kitchens? There's some fucking noise at the front gate. And then, uh, um, I'm just kidding. Uh, Tywin leaves Heron Hall. Fargo Hote and the Brave Companions return with a bunch of prisoners. Sir Armory, Armory Lorch. Do you say Lorch or Lork? Amory Lorch. Say the, whatever you the want to say. audiobook says it anyway. Um, comes out and is like, hey, what's going on? They tell him that Bruce Bolton's tried to cross the river, but the brave companions held back his van. The captives include a bunch of Northmen and Sir Ennis Frey, or Anis Frey. Uh, Amy, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so many options. <laughs> they just started running out of dates. Just pick body parts. I should have gotten <laughs> See why now? <laughs> that's like that's like uh like in the way Rhoda Trees reads it. It's it's Arthur Eyes Wayne. Oh. <laughs> like oh Arthur Eyes, okay. <laughs> um, and Arya knows notices Pink Eye after Anna's Frey, uh, who's her new boss after Weez's death, and she pieces out of there. She meets up with Gendry outside the armory and asks him to help her release the Northmen. But he refuses. He kind of likes where he is and doesn't care which lord he's blacksmithing for. Um, she ends up in the Godswood and... Has her broken broom handle hidden there, where she uses to, or which she uses to practice her serial exercises, water dancing. So after a while, she prays at the heart tree, and then Jock and Hagar shows up. Uh, she asks him to help her get the Northmen released but he says he's only got one person left to do for her. And so she whispers a name to him, Jacquin. And he's like, oh, hell no, take that back. And she says she'll only do it if he helps her free the Northmen. So he's like, okay, but calls her an evil child. <laughs> <laughs> then... They go. Uh, Arya goes to the kitchen and gets some broth on his order. Gross. And he sends her to fetch Pia, 
to serve the brave companions and they all meet up and he's got Rorge and Biter with him and they take several cauldrons of the weasel soup down to the dungeons and hurl them on the guards which kills them apparently and after that the gates are opened and people run away the Northmen get out of there, they fan out around the castle, take control of it, and ultimately Bruce Bolton shows up. Now he's Lord of Harrenhal, and Homegirl becomes his cupbearer. And I'm done. <laughs> you did fine. This gets messy. That's been worse summaries. <laughs> <laughs> I've done worse summaries, I know. <laughs> I, I don't even remember the one when I was hopped up on Viking. Yeah. That was hilarious. I don't, that was, I don't think it was particularly great. Oh, damn, that would have been a good excuse. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, you'd be like, oh, oh don't worry, guys. I'm just on drugs. Yeah, there you go. But, I mean, is this. I mean, maybe, I don't know if I'm the only one, but is this kind of one of the better chapters in all the books? I, I don't know. I really like this chapter. I definitely like it because it kind of gives you a little bit of insight to Jacqueline Hagar and how Arya, you know, tricks him into making you know another oath before all the gods again in the gods would to well, do you, do you force think him she had into anything helping like that out. Planned, or do you think she just like got got scared and then I don't know made the best of the situation? I think happened? she, yeah, I, th I think she just am he just ambushes her basically, yeah. right? So, and I mean that's as much as we talk about how. Uh, Martin does a lot of, you know, subversion of classical tropes. This is kind of like a very tropey moment of, you know, where she's like, I wish for more wishes, sort of, yeah, you know, yeah. in a way. I mean, it, it's, you know, it turns it around a bit, but in, I think, a very clever way. And um, I don't know, just like the, the tension in that scene, it's very, it's very well, well written. And then everything just kind of moves so quickly from there. And then in the end, it doesn't even, you know, I would, you know, I would have a girl on say a name and then it doesn't really matter anyway. You know, so it's very, I don't know, it's very interesting. What was in the damn soup? They put poison in it, right? Like. No, they just they... heated it up and scalded them. Yeah, that's what yeah, I Yeah, who, who yeah. dies from that? Viserys <laughs> dies from scalding. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's gold, but. That's different. That's like molten gold on his head. Well, but if took if I took a really hot boiling pot of water and poured it over a guard's head, they're not fighting back. They're done, you know. Yeah, they, they got it's bigger like problems. Them on fire. And I mean, if it's hot enough, you can go straight to the bone. It'll just melt through their skin. You think so? so yeah. I mean, I have uh, my sister-in-law has a has a scar from like just like a, a gravy boat at Thanksgiving. It was so hot and it spilled on her, and she's got a scar it went all the way to the bone. And that was just like a little section, so. Well, like, I don't know. Because I mean, they're like, they... if, you, if you have really severe burns, you need surgery for that. So presumably, if there's no modern medicine and surgery available, then you probably don't survive very severe burns. Yeah, because you need like skin grafts. Yeah, and, yeah. like they need like, to be debraided and stuff. That that's my thing with it is like, okay, sure they die, but instantly. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're maybe they're probably they're instantly out of it. No, they're probably just incapacitated. And Rorg and Biter finish them off. Oh. Yeah. You know. Okay. Great. Now that they're all screaming about how it burns, it burns, it burns, they're going to be easy kills for them. Gotcha. That makes more sense. Yeah. But I think it's it's all very telling too because Arya notices when the prisoners come in, none of them have had their hands or feet chopped off, um, which she thinks is odd. And she realizes there's about as many of them as there currently is garrisoned at Heron Hall. So all all of these things are you know, and Roose Bolton is like showing up what the next morning, right? Like he's just ready to take over. Yeah. I think it must have happened faster than he thought, but. Well, also some of that may be that uh, they were trying to sort them out on who they can ransom back. But you don't think that you don't think there was some sort of deal struck there? Yeah, probably, or could have been. But even still, 
you know, sometimes deals go sideways or, you know, it turns into a betrayal. So it is entirely possible that they may have thought, well, you know, let's not maim them first, just in case we need to ransom yeah, them for later or that. hold them as actual legit hostages. Vargo Hoth's got to keep his options open. So Exactly. Not everybody can get maimed like Jamie. <laughs> Yeah, later on he's just he's just cutting hands off. <laughs> well, he learned from his mistake, yeah. you know. So I have a question. Here's a real shocking lack of knowledge situation. I've always been really confused. Are Rorge and Biter the ones that were in the like jail cart with Jockin on the way to the wall in the beginning? Yeah. Yes. But they haven't been at Heron Hall this whole time. Uh, when they escaped, they hung out with uh, Jaquin, and they just kind of held around with him. Yeah. Like all three of them oh, okay. did the Lannister service as cell swords. They got yeah, they got in. They got in good at Heron Hall. Okay. And like they were they were in the black cells before they were sent to the Night's Watch. Okay, that's what I thought when I first read this book. I kept thinking. Like, I would keep confusing them with um, Polliver and the Tickler and all that shit. Oh, gotcha. I don't know why. I just was like, oh, did they take new identities? Or It was all very confusing. Like, a couple more deplorable characters that are just kind of, yeah. you know, secondary. Yeah. Yeah, I come to think of it when you put it that way. I guess that's why. I... Yeah. <laughs> Is there gold in the soup? <laughs> oh, no, wait. Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, and I do like how, how Gendry here is just like, look, I can make swords anywhere. Like, I'm I'm good. Really, like, we don't get a lot of the small folk perspective. I mean, life, would life be better for him, you know, in the north? Maybe? But would, how, how would he know that? I say a couple of Arya chapters ago, we know he gets to hang out there by this uh, forge with his shirt off, so. Maybe in Winterfell he thinks it'll be colder and it's not less appealing. Well, he doesn't realize that Winterfell is heated, and, you know, you can just stand and hang your balls out the window and drop <laughs> it like Ned did. Yeah, she well, that actually as a selling point. Hang your balls out the window. That's like, isn't that like the first chapter of Game of Thrones? It, yeah, it's one of them. <laughs> Where he's just, it's like Ned's got his... Yeah. He's got like one foot up on the window, and <laughs> he's just naked, like... <laughs> cooling down <laughs> like, what is going on i don't know so yeah so um heron hall changes uh, hands again and you know it's it's the cursed seat so whatever but uh yeah you know all works out right were you gonna say something not ridiculous <laughs> no i wasn't actually but you guys just like, completely trumped anything ridiculous i was gonna say so i decided to just stf you and like not sound stupid so no i want to hear what you <laughs> ridiculous had to say no i was just gonna point out like i was gonna ask if like he meant if genji would be better off at winterfell now or um than heron hall or later on because now yeah for like two weeks until uh you know the Ironborn show up, and then he's going to yeah, be dead. So, yeah. so you know he, his odds are uh, much better actually at Harrenhal, ironically enough. Yeah, and I, I think like Gendry's point is just sort of like we've had a lot of change of leadership around here, and you know the, the I've been talking to people and they survive it all, and see, you know it's, if you're useful, it seems to work out. So, you know the Lord you know versus the Lord you don't. I guess I don't. So let's see, is Nadia here yet? No. Let's do uh, Danny 3. Let's see. All right. I'll just do that one because it's a quick one here. Um, let's see. It's a day later on August 17th. Danny receives her gifts in Danny 3. This is uh, seven chapters or about 100 pages after Aria 9 in the published order. The Danny chapters get spread around a lot just so that you have Danny chapters to read as you're going through the book, I'm assuming. So let's see. Uh, Danny has been refused help by the Pureborn who rule Quarth, uh, even though she bribed some of them with gold on Duck Sauce's advice. Uh, let's see. She also gets no joy from Duck Sauce, who wants to marry her. This is no surprise to Jorah, who tells Danny that the Quarthine women 
may keep their property on marriage, but they have to give their husband uh, one gift and they cannot refuse. So obviously he'll ask for a dragon and become the most powerful man in the city and yeah, not a good deal for her. So Jorah also warns her that Westerosi nobles will uh, not be won over to her cause that easily. Uh, according to Danny, uh, or sorry, accordingly Danny seeks out Quaith. Um, let's see, they had met and Quaith had given her the you gotta go west to go east speech. And, uh, yep. Tells her that the uh, pyromancers used to just be kind of weak parlor tricks to distract people while they had cut purses, you know, stealing in the crowd, and now they're full on badasses, and it's all because of her dragons, apparently. So, there you have it. Doesn't it say in this chapter, too, that she's not, like, wearing scantily enough clad dresses or something? With, like, one boob out or whatever? Yeah, she's not, she, like, you gotta get the one boob dress going or something, like... I can't remember. I like how she reflects on the treachery of men. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I guess this chapter is mostly just about... You get, like, more of the hints of, like, how significant she and her dragons are, right? From the mystical perspective, yes, but not as far as the, you know, social or political perspective. I mean, she's got, you know, kind of about as much influence as, like, a local traveling circus or carny right now. You know, she's kind of I mean, a little maybe on the higher end of that, but, uh, you know, she's sort of seen as, like, a marvel and a wonder right now, and that's not you know, the direction she wanted to go and she was hoping to get some political sway and that's just hasn't panned out for her. Yeah. And I do like, especially like it shows, even though she's still very young in the book that she is learning a little bit, um, at least politically. And like one thing she takes a note is like all the gifts that she was given, she sells them all except for the crown. So she keeps the crown because she noted that like Viserys was forced to sell the crown and he was seen as the beggar king and she's like, at least, at least I will have a crown. And, you know, kind of keeping up appearances, keeping her head high, like, I thought that was kind of a little bit savvy on her part. I don't know if it's necessarily savvy, because it's not like it's a crown that was won or anything like that. So I think it's just, just as much of, like, an error of youth or to try and, like, reclaim some lost pride for her family. Yeah, maybe it's just... But it's I, I think within... Don't you think within that city, though? I mean, people are like, oh, they've you know they've given her this crown, and she's a queen, and like, hey, where is it? Like, I kind of feel like that's something that would be noted as absent by the people of the city that she's trying to get to help her. So, at least while she's there, like, it's... It's smart. I suppose so, but it doesn't really do her any good. I mean, she doesn't... You know, and that's one of the reasons why she goes to the Warlocks, because nobody else is really choosing to help her out. Yeah, I mean, it's not like she has an army or, you know, any real power, but I think she's she's kind of starting to realize that uh, you got to play the slow game, right? Let's see, and then, um, oh, is this where the dragons get kidnapped? Oh, no, wait, that's not in the book. <laughs> where are my dragons? <laughs> yeah, so what do you think about, I don't know, I mean, because we're about to get into it with uh, with the next chapter a bit more, but... I mean, you know, you, you know, the whole, you gotta go, you know, west to go east, da, da 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 like, I don't know. I mean, is there really anything to that? Yeah, and the Dance of Dragons, when she's out in the uh, fields, after Drogon, like, kind of hauls her off, she starts following a stream, and that's, and, like, if you trace her steps, like, she's following the stream south because she thinks it's going to get her to Marine, but she ends up going north, uh, ultimately. So, yeah, there is actually that whole thing. Because it's kind of sending her back towards the Mother of Mountains. Oh, maybe. Yeah, I think that's a prophecy that we'll sense. see played out fairly, fairly clearly at some point. Hmm. Like, yeah, I just I feel like like especially when we get into the next chapter, like with, well, I I just think a lot of the prophecies that we get from George, like a fair amount of them, either won't pan out, or will prove to be some sort of misdirection. I, th I think this you know? one will though. I think this is one of the the ones. I have yeah. A bit more faith in. So when the next book comes out, I think we'll see that one. So in twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So by by uh, the time we have, let's see, how long is Trump going to be president? Um, 
maybe <laughs> uh, maybe when we have the next president elected. I don't know. We'll see. When Brexit has actually happened. Winter... <laughs> yeah, winter is coming eventually. Eventually. You know. The sea's long in publishing world, just like in the book world. Um, what do you guys think of the part where she's like, to touch light, you must pass beneath shadow, and Danny immediately is like, a shy? She would have me go to a shy. And then she starts asking her, like, will they give me an army? Will there be gold and ships? And what will I find there that I won't find in Karth? And then Quaith just says, truth. When I very first read this, and as I continue to read it, Danny's like immediate, a shy is just so, like, duh, that I feel like it, she's not talking about a shy. And then Quaith doesn't really confirm. Yeah, because I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't understand how a shy could be the. Like, I just don't understand how she would have to go there, especially given everything that's happened with her current situation in the book, so. But have we had any instances of any characters interpreting prophecies more or less correctly? Because uh, that's correctly? actually also something I'd like, like to Abby... see, because in general, if a character interprets a prophecy a certain way, you can usually tell that that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. And I'd like to see, at least with like a small thing or whatever, I'd like someone to... Yeah, they get right. it. Like a lot of people don't even realize it's a yeah. prophecy a lot of times, or you know, like as the re as the book reader, you go, oh, okay, so, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of any one instance, but I feel like there was one at least. I can think of like Jaharis being told by the ghost of High Heart to marry Rayala and Aga or uh, Ares, right, but, but like a prophecy that's about that we, <laughs> like, a prophecy that that, we see so... in the books, where, where we where we hmm. does Cersei try to? analyze the Maggie the Frog bullshit or she's just like whatever. But I think that's I think with Cersei in particular the general assumption is if she thinks that's one way then that's definitely not That's how it's gonna end up. Or, uh, well no, Cersei's tend to be like yeah. a self fulfilling prophecy, even though she tries to do things right. to make it not happen. So I mean I, I and I would think that most characters in the book, if there's a prophecy about them, they're not gonna be aware of it. I mean, aside from Stannis you don't see anyone really walking around going I am the one that was foretold so yeah. they, it, it's sort of like they fulfill it just by happenstance it seems toward to them but well, with the exception of Cersei who realizes of... like it was you know a direct implication directly at her yeah. and it was like a directly straightforward thing there was no like you know shrouded in mystery or anything like and that. she still gets some of it wrong right <laughs> that's like the, but that's one where like some parts of those are just very blatant like yeah the, it's hard to yeah, it would, be, it would be hard to misinterpret that. I'm just like, oh, my kids are gonna die, my, you know. But like the whole with the the queen, you know, younger and more beautiful, all that, like you know, that's just anyone who Cersei doesn't like at the moment. Yeah. Um. So, tacked on to that, if to reach light, you must pass beneath shadow. Isn't a shy. To me, that's like so many number of things right like the walls of any city that she comes across the great pyramid in marine perhaps even the pale mare or just the shadow of drogon flying over her there's a lot right yeah and i mean i you also have to think too some of this was written early enough that maybe he gave himself some narrative freedom mm with some of these to, to be able to to either make them true or not true like in more than one way yeah that might be maybe maybe he didn't have the whole southeast whatever thing figured out and, and those kinds of things but that's something you can always find a way to, to fit in yeah yeah you don't need to plan that in detail i would say do you have any thoughts about what it could be any special okay. guesses no. like what the truth would be if she went to a shy or that too, yeah. Oh. Or if it's not a shy, yeah. what is what is the shadow she's talking about? You're the shadow, baby. You should know. That's true. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Nadia is joining us, everybody. With a different Whoa. voice. 
gnarly. But yeah, I was just about to say that there have been some interpretations of the whole prophecy where it says, you know, she, to go west you must go east, and some it's basically that she has to go to go forward, she has to go back, right? And mm-hmm. at the end of Danny's storyline in Dance of Dragons, she's she's basically gone back to the Great Grass Sea, which is where she basically started out from. Right. Right. So that might be kind of part of the prophecy being fulfilled. Like, like the prophecies, I'm not, you know, I don't need all of the prophecies to, like, you know, tick them off as the books go through. Like, some of them can just fall to the side, some of them can be wrong, like, you know, it's fine. But it is fun to try to figure out. Yeah, it's like a murder mystery, I love it. At the end of Dance with Dragons, it's not like how they did all that in the show. Drogon shows up and lands Right with that Kalasar that surrounds her. No, well, when um, I don't think he lands. I think he's just there when the when the Kalasar shows up. Like he's just kind of was he like sitting on a rock or something while she's out in the field. Like he's nearby, right? Are we talking about the show? Should we give a spoiler? Is it really a spoiler like to say that the show does. is different? No show spoilers. No show spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it's not a significant like the you know the show difference or whatever is not like a significant no. point here anyway. No. So. But he is there, right? Yeah, in the, yeah, that's what you know. It gets confusing, but yeah, in the book, he's—I uh, don't know how close he is. I don't remember, but he's—he's he's nearby, right? Like, in the book, he has like a layer. Something. Yeah, in the book, he has a layer that he hangs out in, and then he goes out hunting, and he flies back to, and that's where like he's been keeping Daenerys, and Daenerys has just been sort of like, you know, living off like his scrap pieces of food, and then she is like, okay, I need to go back because. He's just not going to be a taxi service and fly me around wherever I want. I need to go, like, back to Marine. So she leaves and strikes out on her own. I'm getting my... But I, okay. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a little while since I've read it. I could have sworn that it, like, like he was nearby, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you guys, uh, are you ready to move on to the House of the Undying? <laughs> to be continued... Um, we did record a discussion on House of the Undying, uh, Danny 4, but that was uh, so long that we decided to make that its own episode. So thank you for joining us, and uh, look for that episode right after this.